Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Catherine Flockhart, and I'm here from Bailey Gifford, and we are managers of the uh, Keystone Positive Change Investment Trust. Thank you to everyone that, that's come in person, and also welcome to those who've, who've dialed in online. Right, let's see if I, yep, I'm capable of clicking through the slides, so this is a good start. Um, so, this morning, I would like to extend an invitation to you all on behalf of the Keystone Positive Change Investment Trust, an invitation to travel through time, to expand your time horizons, and to consider how we can help to catalyze change. So let's start with traveling through time and extending our time horizons. The investment community is becoming increasingly short term. At Bailey Gifford, we don't think in weekly or quarterly terms, or even with an annual mindset, but with a mindset that looks out five or even 10 years and beyond. But let's look even further ahead than that, not just in decades, um, but today let's think about the time frame of 250 years. So this graph here takes us back to the late 1700s and the onset of the Industrial Revolution. And it depicts five technological surges or trends that have happened over that 250 year period. The five great surges of development. The first is the Industrial Revolution, which led to mechanization, huge productivity gains, and growth in average incomes. Sorry, I'm, so, I, I'm going to lean a bit to, to, to make sure this picks me up. The second is the onset of steam and railways, which improved transportation of raw materials and finished goods, created economic activities and spread ideas more rapidly. The introduction of steel, electricity and heavy engineering is the third, and it enabled a widespread adoption of technological systems such as telegraph, rail networks, water supplies and sewage systems, and it allowed unprecedented movement of people and ideas, so a wave of globalization. The fourth surge here represents the introduction of oil and mass production, enabling greater access to a range of products made from petrochemicals. And the fifth surge is the information and technology age, the age of greater access to information, of exponential connectivity, and of digitalization. So at this stage, I must confess I'm not a historian, so apologies to any of you in the room who are, if I've used incorrect terminology. Um, but I think the point that this, this makes is threefold. Firstly, what this diagram illustrates to us is the phenomenal progress that we've made over the last few centuries. In many ways, the world is a much better place than it was generations ago. Millions of people have been lifted out of poverty. Life expectancy has more than doubled in a few generations. Literacy globally has improved to under from under 10% of the population in the 1800s to nearly 90% today. Secondly, we know that we can learn a lot from history. So we have enjoyed working with academics at the universities of Sussex and Utrecht, who've helped us to apply a historical lens to help us think about the future and about how big societal shifts are going to be critical for us to understand as long-term investors. And thirdly, what this illustrates is that we are at a really important juncture in time. If defining the previous 250 years that started with the first industrial revolution is the first deep transition, some scholars believe that today we're at the beginnings of the second deep transition which is a response to the problems created by the first. While there's been an immense improvement in standard of living for many people around the world, our world is also now in crisis. It won't have gone unnoticed by those of you in this room that our world is on fire. Climate change is taking its toll and at a terrifying pace with wildfires ravaging through parts of Europe and North America this summer the extreme flooding in China that we've seen, and droughts in India. Extreme weather is impacting homes, livelihoods, food availability, and supply chains. And it's not just climate change that we have to worry about today. 
We might all be living longer, but we're not necessarily healthier. We've just lived through the global pandemic and we've seen the awful impacts of that. And although hundreds of millions of people have been lifted out of poverty, there are still more than 4 billion people, so over half of the global population, living in poverty today on less than 3,000 US dollars per year. It could be said that we are at a watershed moment in time. Faced with the choice of continuing down the path that we're on, or having the bravery, ambition, determination, and optimism to help steer us onto a more sustainable footing. So what if, at this watershed moment in time, we chose to leave behind the ravaging wildfires and work towards a more sustainable, healthier, and inclusive future. So we've traveled back in time, and now let us travel forward. Come 2050, London could look like this, with fewer cars on the road due to more shared electrified mobility, both on the ground and in the air, from flying taxis. We could have more greenery, enabling more biodiversity, and perhaps some vertical farming. Harder to illustrate, but let's assume that the standard of housing is more equal and that within these buildings, more people have access to high quality and affordable education and training delivered online or through virtual reality headsets. It all sounds quite fanciful, perhaps, but many of these technologies, in fact, exist today and are already starting to deliver progress. Now, I don't know about you, but I want to be a problem solver and an optimist and an investor in the solutions that deliver a better future. And that's one of the reasons that I love being involved with the Keystone Positive Change Investment Trust, because it aims to play a role in addressing and resolving these global challenges. To steer us onto a more positive trajectory, human ingenuity and tremendous amounts of capital are going to be essential. And this is where we, so asset owners and savers, and those directing capital investment managers can play a role in channeling capital towards companies whose products and services are providing the solutions to global challenges. And this isn't just about making change, it's also about delivering great returns in the process. Because companies that can deliver solutions to challenges are likely to thrive over the long term. We think they will see rising demand for their products and services, They'll be able to carve out strong competitive advantages and have loyal customer bases. And also, they'll be able to attract and retain highly motivated employees who really link into their sense of purpose. And that is why the Keystone Positive Change Investment Trust has not just one objective, but two. So we seek to deliver attractive investment returns, i.e. to beat the benchmark over rolling five-year periods and we also aim to contribute towards a more sustainable world for current and future generations. So in some ways we share much with the other Bailey Gifford investment trusts that you'll be familiar with, a desire to invest in high quality growth businesses, but we're different in that we're looking to contribute towards positive change and to help undo the negative externalities of the first transition that I mentioned. Now, we didn't know that this type of investing had a particular name when we started out with our two objectives, but we quickly came to realize that this is known as impact investing, which is defined by deliver investing to deliver financial returns and positive social or environmental impact. Before we go on to talk a little bit more about the future of positive change, though, I wanted to just take a second to talk about why growth investing at this juncture in time and actually I understand that this is, this is something that's come up in, in conversation already this morning, and I think it's really important to, to focus on it. Uh, so we have looked at data um, for every company in the index that's experienced a drawdown of more than 50% since 1999. So this is more than 3,000 companies, and we've looked over you know, that long period, which encompasses a range of interest rate environments, of economic environments and indeed the global financial crisis. 
And one point which holds true is that the companies who were able to recover to their peak within five years are those that are able to deliver that superior earnings growth. Looking at this data another way, and this is a slide that we've been using to show clients for a very long time, as long-term investors with a five-year investment horizon, we know that over that period of time, share prices follow fundamentals. So the companies at the top right of this slide as you're looking at it, who can deliver the highest earnings growth are the companies that deliver the highest share price outperformance over that five-year period and beyond. So clearly we've been through a volatile and tumultuous market period, but it's worth not losing sight of the fact that across a range of different environments, fundamental stock picking in really exceptional growth businesses works in terms of delivering returns. But coming back to Keystone specifically, I thought it's important just to talk through the features of, of the trust. So Keystone aims to invest in exceptional companies whose products and services deliver solutions. This isn't about avoiding the worst of vendors, but it's about proactively channeling capital towards those solutions providers. It's a global strategy and a concentrated one, so it invests in between 30 to 50 companies. It invests in both private companies and publicly listed businesses, enabling it to invest in and support companies across the spectrum of maturity. And it's contributing to positive change across four impact themes. Social inclusion and education, environment and resource needs, healthcare and quality of life, and base of the pyramid, which is investing to meet the needs of those people that I mentioned earlier who still live below the global poverty line. So doing this, we apply an active, a long-term and a growth philosophy. So what does this actually look like in reality? Well, let's try and bring this to life a bit using a few examples. So let me take you back to the onset of the Industrial Revolution again for a moment. The textiles industry was one of the first to adopt modernized production methods in the late 1700s, including mechanized spinning powered by steam and water, which increased the output per worker by more than 500 times. And progress has continued since then, meaning clothing has become faster and cheaper to produce, to the extent that we buy more, but we keep things for about half the length of time that we used to, 15 years ago, and we use clothing less frequently. In fact, what we do now is we buy, we use, and we dispose. So while that means that catwalk fashions are more readily available, it comes at a huge environmental cost. The emissions from the fashion industry are more than all of international shipping and flights combined. The production of textiles is very water intensive, so it takes more than two and a half thousand liters of water to produce a single white t-shirt, which is the equivalent uh, of drinking water for an average person for two and a half years. One bin of lorry waste takes fibers to landfill every second. And this is before we consider the social impacts of working conditions in sweatshops in Asia, for example. This complex linear system needs to be tra transformed into one that keeps products in the system for longer, that expands the lifespan of clothing, that uses more sustainable materials, and that can collect, treat, and reuse discarded items. So a few years ago, my colleague Kate attended the Copenhagen Fashion Summit to learn more about the how the industry itself is thinking about the challenges it poses and potential solutions. And this is an example of the really differentiated research that we try to undertake, which is not just hearing consensus ideas from brokers, but actually getting out there and doing our own research and tapping into differentiated sources of insight. So at the Copenhagen Fashion Summit, Kate was intrigued to see samples of washable salmon leather and leather made out of pineapple leaves. Which takes me to the trust's investment in Spiber, whose fibers are on display here in this rather futuristic image. So Spiber is a really exciting Japanese company that combines biology and engineering skills to make sustainable fibers. It genetically modifies bacteria to produce proteins that can be made, into desir made with desirable characteristics. So its product pipeline includes an alternative to cashmere, 
and next will be um, materials such as silk, wool, leather, fur, and even replacing man-made fibers as a potential. So as this company scales, its materials will be made with much lower carbon emissions and use less land than use less land and water than fibers that are available today, and they will also be biodegradable. So from an investment perspective, we're tremendously excited about the growth runway that Spiber has, as it's able to bring costs down and take share in the gigantic global fiber market. We're excited by the partnerships that, the business, that this business has already secured, which we think creates a really strong competitive advantage for it. So Spiber is a great example of a company that is doing things differently and challenging the status quo, and in doing so, we think can deliver excellent returns and also address the environment and resource needs theme that I mentioned earlier. So from lab-grown fibers to the duo owl is quite sweet. So this friendly green owl is a mascot for what we describe as a mission-obsessed company that wants to deliver free and equal access to education. It's the most popular language learning app and one that I'm sure a number of you will be familiar with. Does anyone in the room use Duolingo? There we go, we've got a good show of hands. Um, and it has ambitions that span way beyond language learning into maths, literacy, and even music. And Duolingo isn't just an app that's used by relatively wealthy individuals in developed economies to learn French before they go on holiday. It's also crucially used by students in a range of markets who are, for example, looking to learn English, which we know is clearly linked to better economic, <clears throat> to better economic prospects over the long term. So by providing language learning that is free, fun, and effective, Duolingo is helping to lower barriers to greater e economic opportunities. It's helping to improve educational outcomes for ch children. And there are even studies that point to the health benefits of adult learning, for example, helping to present, prevent the early onset of Alzheimer's. But how does a mission-focused company offering free education make a good investment? Well, it monetizes its app through subscriptions. Um, so about 8% of its 74 million users pay for its services, for its premium offering. And it sells advertising, and it also generates revenues through language testing. So the runway for growth is stark, because there are 1.8 billion language learners globally. And what's really more, even more exciting is that Duolingo's engaging and convenient offering could actually expand that market. I know so many people who didn't have, have the intention to relearn a language until they, they access the ease of doing th so through Duolingo. It's a great example also of what we call a flywheel effect. So it has a fantastic growth runway and it becomes stronger as it grows. So as it attracts more customers, it's able to gather more data and improve its proposition, which in turn allows it to attract more customers and indeed, its cost of customer acquisition is very low because it has a very high degree of um, word of mouth recommendations at the moment. So it's a great example of how said submission, as well as a profitable business model, can go hand in hand, which is a rarity within the education sector. So this sits in our social inclusion and education theme. And finally, I wanted to talk to you about Dexcom, which is still probably one of my, my favorite uh, companies in the portfolio. Um, and you'll, you'll hear why. Um, so despite some of the phenomenal medical advances that I mentioned earlier, globalization and urbanization are contributing to the spread of disease and lifestyle-related lifestyle diseases are increasing globally. So take diabetes, for example. Since the 1980s, diabetes has more than quintupled globally, and there are now more than 530 million adults living with diabetes. And sadly, three, of, three out of four adults with diabetes now live in low- and middle-income countries. So this image here shows a young girl with a small patch on her arm, which is what's called a continuous glucose monitor, and it's produced by a company that we hold in the portfolio, Dexcom. And Dex, Dexcom has really been pioneering in designing, making, and selling these devices, which are a replacement for fingerprint tests. So not only are these more convenient than having to take multiple finger prick tests for diabetics, but they're also better because they don't just allow for a reading at a point in time, 
which gives the diabetic only part of the picture that they need, but it allows patients to see the upward trend and to monitor continuously whether or not they're remaining in range. And this helps diabetic patients to avoid many of the long-term complications that can be associated with that, with that illness. Also, as a mother of two, I find it particularly striking that these uh, products have been the first that mean that carers of diabetics don't have to wake them up during the night to undertake finger prick tests, but it instead can rest with the peace of mind that they'll receive an alert if their child goes out of range. And they're also a great example of how our two objectives go hand in hand. So over the period that we have invested in Dexcom for our broader positive change strategy, which manages the Keystone Investment Trust, this company has expanded its reach from 300,000 patients to now more than 1.7 million. Sales have gone from $700 million to $3 billion per year, and the company has moved from being loss-making to profitable, and the share price has increased five-fold over that period of time. So I hope these examples give you a flavor of what the trust invests in. And I said we're the same as the, the growth trust that you may be very familiar with from Bailey Gifford, but we're also different because we have this impact objective. And we're really committed to this objective, and we want to be held accountable for it. But measuring progress in the non-financial outputs of our companies is pretty challenging. There's no single metric that we can use across the portfolio, and even in areas like carbon emissions, there isn't a clear yet unified standard of reporting. And some stuff is just really hard to measure. So, for example, how do we measure that Duolingo's language learning app has increased cultural understanding? So it's really hard, but it's really important. And so we produced an annual impact report, which is available on, on our website, which outlines how each company is progressing to making an impact through its core products and services. So let's look back at Dexcom. We've used this framework based on the theory of change to illustrate how the company's inputs and activities lead to outputs, outcomes, and impacts which is the long-term systemic change that this company is driving. And we do this for each and every company in the portfolio. Where there is commonality amongst the metrics, we also do aggregate them to illustrate portfolio-level progress. So this impact wheel gives you a flavor of the types of things we measure and report on. And there are 12 statistics all in all in the report this year. These statistics aren't perfect. Of course, there are caveats. But we're trying to be transparent, consistent, and conservative in our approach. And we don't make estimates here. These numbers are all based on real figures that are reported from the companies in which we invest and which are verifiable. So let's circle back to the beginning, where I invited you to travel through time, to expand your horizons, and consider a way to help catalyze change. Thank you for indulging me. I hope the last 20 minutes or so have highlighted that we are at a watershed moment in time, that capital can be a really powerful mechanism for change, and that channeling capital to companies that are challenging the status quo and that are providing solutions for people and planet can be good for people, planet, and for savers. It can help us to invest and save into a far more inclusive, healthier, and sustainable world for us our children, and for future generations. None of it individually can be the solution. It's going to take many actors in society to succeed. But in co collaboration, we can absolutely be part of the solution. And I think that is incredibly exciting. So with that, I'll stop and take any questions. I'm um, just curious, going back to the Dexcom one, um, why Dexcom over Libra, who have the contract with the NHS to provide them for diabetes in the UK? Sure. So Dexcom has actually been uh, a market leader. Um, so there, there have been sort of two large players in this market. Dexcom is a US-based company and has significant share within the US, though it's not yet here in the, in the UK. It has very substantial market share. And what we particularly like about Dexcom is actually des the design of that continuous glucose monitoring device, which it has, we think has had an edge over some of its competitors. So um, for example, one of them is able to take 
a number of tests at points in time, but actually isn't monitoring in a continuous fashion, which the Dexcom device does. So Dexcom has great and very substantial share in other markets, and we think it can roll out over a period of time. Though actually, this is also a market where you could see more than one player actually succeeding as the market expands, but we've, we've always liked that Dexcom technology. Okay, first question. With the economic outlook looking precarious, the market has quickly shifted its focus away from the opportunity of the energy transition to its cost. Has this had much of an impact on your portfolio? And is this shift a in sentiment short term blip, or is it likely to persist? Um, yeah, so great question. And I've just trying to make sure I address all of the elements of that question. Um, so first of all, has this had an impact on the portfolio? Well, clearly, on a short-term view, share prices in the portfolio have been weak. But again, I would really point back to the longer-term performance of the positive change strategy, which runs the Keystone Investment Trust, which is still on a since inception, which is a little over five years, outperforming the global broad stock market index by 10% per annum. So we've seen share price weakness recently, in part driven by market sentiment, but I would place that short-term weakness and volatility within that long-term context. And absolutely, you know, that's applied to, to some of the companies in the environment and resource needs area. Um, but it really doesn't change what we're aiming to do. And again, I really think this is where that long-term view and focus on structural trends helps us. You know, None of it, we don't claim to have an edge in predicting macroeconomic policy in the short term or, or, or short term sentiment. But what we do know is that we think there's a very clear long term direction of travel. You know, I spoke about the physical warming of the planet and the physical impacts that that will have. And we think that that only adds to the long term impetus and the need to invest in renewable technology. Um, and in, in a range of different solutions that can help us to address um, global sustainability challenges. We've seen over the long term the cost competitive of renewable energy you know, really improving, um, and we've seen an increasing range of really exciting companies come through in the portfolio. So we continue to look for opportunities in these areas. Again, you know, for us it's about active stock picking as opposed to thematically investing into an area. So actually, not for the positive change strategy per se, but at Bailey Gifford more broadly, I'll be honest and say one of the worst investment mistakes we made was investing in solar panels many years ago. Um, so we were invested in a German solar panel manufacturer, but in fact what happened was that the Chinese flooded the market with cheap supply, um, which, which collapsed the price. So there was that sort of supply side dynamic was very, very poor. So you know what that's taught us you know, along with that long-term patient active stock picking discipline that we have, that this is about doing analysis of individually very strong companies that can build up strong competitive advantages and deliver superior returns, whilst also providing the, the, um, the solutions and the innovation that we need to tackle climate change. Thanks. Um, second question. Does your portfolio cover all 17 SDGs and which are the hardest to get exposure to? So that's a good question, and I forget. So I think we're covering, ooh, I might get this slightly wrong, but 15 of, the, 15 of the, the SDGs. So there are two that we don't currently address. I think one that I think is quite hard to directly address through equity investment is partnership for the goals, which is sort of about working across organizations to advance the goals. So I think it's unlikely we'll be addressing that one, but broad, you know, we're addressing that broad spectrum of the SDGs. Okay. Sorry, we had two questions in the room. Shall I yeah, yes, pop please. to these chats yep. and I'll come back to you? Um, thank you very much. Um, what's the advantage of owning Keystone versus the open-ended strategy? So I think Keystone's really exciting, and one of the reasons we were particularly excited to be able to take Keystone on is that Keystone is able to access both the listed companies that are in the open-ended OIC that we run, um, but also some really exciting unlisted companies. So we have just over 5% of the trust 
invested in, in private companies. So Spiber that I mentioned at the beginning, the, the, the fiber manufacturer is a private company. We also have investments in North Vault, which is going to be, we think, critical to, to batteries and to, to the energy revolution. Um, Climeworks, a carbon capture company, Boston Metal, which is a green steel manufacturer, um, and uh, a quantum computing company, funnily enough. So Keystone gives us that broader opportunity set. We also have one listed company that's not quite liquid enough to go into the border strategy in the OIC. So Keystone really offers that really broad opportunity set, which we're excited about. And we will, over a period of time, continue to look for, for those um, private companies or unlisted opportunities that, that we think fit the trust. Um, so my question is, uh, how do you mitigate, mitigate against greenwashing? This is what the CMT defense. Sure. So, um, as with really, I think, you know, on the traditional investment risk side, I think your greatest uh, defense against greenwashing is simply proper, good old fashioned fundamental research. So many of the companies that we're buying for this portfolio, we'll be looking at them for months, if not years, before buying them. Every company that goes into this portfolio will have at least one, often several, pieces of fundamental investment research written by a Bailey Gifford analyst. And at Bailey Gifford, everyone at the company, from our investment graduates that join us on day one, right up to our joint senior partner, spend the majority of their time writing fundamental company research. And that's based on this really wide array of sources that I mentioned earlier. So we're not really using sell-side research much anymore. We don't think it offers much in insight and differentiation. We're getting out there, speaking to academics, industry experts, independent experts to understand the companies. And each company that it goes into the portfolio also has a dedicated piece of impact, fundamental research written on it by an impact analyst who is dedicated to this strategy. Um, so, for example, we bought um, shares in John Deere, or Deere, the tractor manufacturer, which many of you will know about, because we were really excited about the sustainable agriculture business that they have, which is a strategic focus for management, which is a growing part of their business, and it's actually also more profitable because it's got a significant software component associated. When we were looking at that, we had one of our impact analysts do a real deep dive into is this greenwashing? Is this virtue signaling? Or is this really meaningful for this company? And in doing so, we worked with the James Hutton Institute, who are sustainable agriculture experts that happen to be on our doorstep in Edinburgh, to actually understand whether or not the technologies that that company is applying, we think can meaningfully shift the dial with respect to the sustainable agriculture challenges that we have. So very long way of saying it's about resource, it's about patience, and it's about doing proper fundamental research. Any more questions online? Yeah, a couple more. Um, as a long-term private investor, I wish I'd focused more on trusts for longer than I did. Which technologies have not delivered yet, and do you see new capabilities changing that? Which technologies have not delivered yet, and do we see new capabilities changing that? So I, again, I think this is really coming back to, I think, the, the energy transition that we're on the precipice of at the moment. You know, I do think we are going to see a wholesale change in how energy works for our society as we have to wean ourselves off fossil fuels globally and move towards a renewable energy economy. And that is going to touch every single part of the economy. But it's going to require significant advancement in areas that I think are showing really exciting promise and showing significant advancement, but are still in the early stages. So improved battery technology, and we're constantly keeping ahead of the rapid advancements in battery technology um, from basic battery composition of where it is today to, to things that are quite out there, like solid state composition that will allow for, for batteries that have a much, much longer lifespan, um, for example. Um, another area would be something like, like Boston Metal that we've just invested in, green steel and the ability to produce the stuff that we need for the economy, but in a much more carbon-like manner. Um, those would, the, those would be areas that I think would still be nascent. And then, you know, I mentioned Psi Quantum that we're invested in. Quantum computing and harnessing the increasing power of AI, which we're really just starting to see breakthrough now. These, for me, are, are, are probably the, the ones that really spring to mind as emergent technologies that I think are going to be game changers over the long run. 
Super. Final question. Will ESG considerations take a back seat for investors if the economy tips over into recession? And would this be a headwind for your portfolio? Sorry, one other, just to come back to the other question, one thing that I've also neglected to mention is within healthcare as well. So what we've seen in healthcare has been this tremendous convergence of different technologies. So we've seen increased computing power and ability to harness AI combined with the ability to do gene sequencing and to produce personalized medicine has been and will be tremendously powerful in transforming healthcare outcomes. So again, within the positive change strategy that, that runs the Keystone Investment Trust, we, we invested in Moderna at IPO, one of the COVID vaccine manufacturers. And when we invested in that company, they had an unproven technology, which was mRNA as a basis for producing vaccines and medicines. And what we've now seen is COVID provided proof of concept for that medicine. And we now have access to a tremendously valuable platform that I think can, can transform healthcare outcomes. So I think that's another area of emergent technology that's that's tremendously exciting. Um, but coming back to the question about recession and about ESG investing taking a back seat, you know, I think we've already seen a very significant fall off in markets um, on the back of concerns about clearly changing interest rate environment and general worries about the macroeconomic backdrop. We are not trying to predict what that macroeconomic backdrop will be over the long term. Um, and again, I'm sort of, you know, I'm not sure that sort of short term sentiment shifts around ESG investing, whatever that means, are really something that we're particularly aiming to predict. And indeed, we've been running the positive change strategy since 2017, a point in time really kind of before ESG investing was quite in vogue in the way that it is now. And I guess my own view is that just by simply, you know, focusing on that superior stock picking on selecting excellent individual active opportunities in which to invest and finding companies that are going to be winners and addressing sustainable development challenges, I feel that you know the, the trust will be in an incredibly strong position on a long-term view, regardless of sort of shorter term sentiment shifts. And I think you know we have seen a significant drawdown in the in the recent period. Um, and the portfolio I think is now from, from a valuation and a, an entry point looking you know really quite attractive. Thank you. One other question just come in. Um, can you just explain the differences between, obviously, the trust and the OIC? Sure. So a similar question to, to, to that which um, I just addressed in the room here. So the key difference between the trust and the OIC is that the trust is able to invest in unlisted or private equities in addition to listed equities. So we currently have just over 5% of the trust. Um, is invested in a range of really exciting unlisted companies. So I showed you Spiber earlier, the, the, the um, fiber manufacturer. We've got some really exciting early stage energy, um, renewable energy and battery companies in the portfolio there. Um, so, the port, so the trust has a slightly broader opportunity set and it's also able to invest in one or two smaller listed companies that are not accessible by the OIC because of the open-ended nature of the OIC. So the trust has a slightly broader opportunity set than um, than the OIC does. Gentleman at the back. Uh, when you invest, uh, probably the investment will not uh, perform as expected. Um, is there any cases you invested and then for some reasons it didn't perform as expected and you get it off the investment at all? Do you have that kind of experience in the past? Yeah, absolutely. We make mistakes. Um, and if anything, you know, the recent period, I think, has been as long term investors, you go through periods of significant market volatility and uh, as, of drawdowns. And I think what you're always trying to do is really learn from those periods, but at the same time, stay true to your own philosophy. And we really firmly believe in that fundamental growth philosophy coming through. I think what we've learned over the past couple of years is I think there were a few names in the portfolio where we knew that the, so we have a baseline and we reassess our companies when valuation changes significantly on can this company really double on a five year view from where it's at today and that's our rough growth hurdle. And I think there were companies in the portfolio where the probability of that doubling happening was really much smaller than we had, we had, um, you know, attributed. Um, so I think we've learned that and we've sort of redoubled that focus on valuation. 
But at the same time, we don't want to become too cautious because when I, I look at something like Moderna or Dexcom, which have been hugely successful investments for the strategy, those were companies where we've done strong fundamental research. They were pre-profitability, but they had really exciting technology that we thought should be transformational. We want to keep taking those, those bets. For us, if we can invest in a few names that really, really work out, they more than pay for the few small mistakes that we hopefully make. So, for example, Teladoc would be a mistake that we made. So it's an online like telemedicine company that's based in the U.S. Um, and it was able to, we thought, potentially disrupt the health industry in a, in a quite an exciting way by offering patients virtual consultations, things like services for um, counseling or mental health services, where obviously physical presence is not particularly necessary and plug patients into a broader network beyond that in their locality. We really liked that Teladoc had a strong relationship with the payors. So in the US, where it's obviously a very different health system to here with the companies that were sponsoring a lot of the, um, the private insurance plans. But we really underestimated the difficulty of that company or indeed any company to navigate the incumbent system, which is very entrenched in the US. Um, and we saw real changing habits with significant uptake and use in their services during the pandemic, but then that reversing very, very quickly when we came out of the pandemic, combined with, with some poor uh, acquisition discipline by management. So that's a case of saying growth, growth opportunity there didn't work out, sell the shares and move on. But that had always been a small position size. And again, over the long term, life of the strategy has been more than paid for by by the, the ones that we get right. So absolutely, we'll make mistakes. We try and learn from those mistakes. But it's about focusing on getting a few companies in that portfolio that can really deliver exceptional returns. And that's what's allowed us to outperform over the long run. Just one more question. How long do you wait uh, when you decide to get it off it? Good question. We're typically really quite patient. So sometimes that patience will work against us and we'll give the companies too long. But again, we know on balance that over the long run, that patience works in our favor um, and hence that sort of strong long-term uh, long track record. And to be honest, that really varies by company and it also varies depending on the indicator and the sort of the severity of the, the miss that you've seen. Um, so if I think about something like um, Beyond Meat, um, which was a plant-based protein company that we invested in. You know, there were some disappointing quarterly results. We went and spoke to management. They suggested some areas where we expected to see improvement. And when we did not see that coming through in the fundamentals, we sold. A company like Mercado Libre that's been in the portfolio where share price was very, very weak during the course of 2022. But actually, the fundamental underlying indicators that we had looked at, so this is a Latin American e-commerce platform, we were looking at share of e-commerce in Latin America, and we were looking at growth in customers using its fintech, so its disruptive uh, financial um, platform, we're still growing really nicely. So all of the fundamental indicators look pretty good for us, so then we're very happy to be patient, and that company has actually been a top contributor over the more recent period. So notice that time period, we will be quite patient. Sometimes that doesn't work out, but on balance, that tends to work out in our favor. I think that's, that's it for questions. I won't keep you from, from lunch any longer. Thank you very much. Thank you very much,